Okay, let me call the meeting to order at 3.32. And we have the uh, dubious issue of somebody taking minutes. Um, I guess it's only been, oops, Fred disappeared just when the minutes came up. Yeah, uh, I said uh, he was gonna try to rejoin to get a better connection. Oh, okay, yes, I assume so. <laughs> He's opportunistic, but not that bad. Um, how's it sound now, Fred? I don't know if you can hear us. Um, now I we heard a little of you. Um, yeah, I'll I'll watch on Zoom, but I I can only do the audio via phone. Okay, but you can hear us now. I can hear you now. Well, that means you uh, you qualified to take minutes. Oh, well, great! He's okay. disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. He's gone again. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, well, uh, we'll do that. Okay, moving on. Um, so we have a number of things to deal with. One of the things that uh, we were putting off and whether Dorothy is okay with uh, plowing into this thing, we were basically trying to work on our, I mean, it depends on what order we're going to do. Brad wanted to do a few things on heat pump and on environmental justice. Then we have the issue of ongoing major activities and trying to focus this meeting on, uh, on just all the issues on the, on the outreach in terms of programs and this and that, that we were trying to, that we were waiting for Dorothea to get back on so that we could sort of start tackling where we think we want to go on there, I could pull up that spreadsheet of things that we were working on. Mm -hmm. um, and whether we, uh, I can't tell whether to uh, start with that or do a few small things, like whether we give Brad the chance to just sort of do the two things he wanted to do, and then we could just spend uh, the rest of the meeting on the outreach stuff, along with any updates. I'm good with whatever. I mean, I guess maybe, you know, anything that we feel could kind of spiral into a larger conversation, maybe that might be best to uh, set aside for later in the meeting, perhaps. I mean, it basically, be it's, it's the main meat of it. So that'll take time. Why don't we let you uh, deal with the two things that you had there, and then we'll do a quick updates, and then we'll move into this big topic that we want to muscle through. All right. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, I guess probably the best way to do this is to share my screen. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let me take that over. And I'm not looking to take too long to do this stuff. Um, all right. All right, so um, just a quick background uh, with this. Uh, Dorothy and I talked about a month and a half ago about me uh, kind of collecting some content to, um, you know, just kind of uh, inform, um, uh, the kind of environmental justice focus um, and, you know, information that we could eventually share with the larger community. Um, and so I started digging around and, um, you know, something that we first chatted with, because I, I had recently attended a GIS um, uh, data analysis seminar about maybe, you know, getting some like air, local air pollution data. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe comparatively between like, for example, Sherborne and uh, Framingham. Um, and as I started to think more about that, it's like, you know, that, that might not suit our needs and it might actually lead to some kind of spurious ideas, uh, spurious uh, conclusions, just because, you know, our air quality in Sherborne is probably great. And Framingham's probably, you know, uh, at an inferior level to ours. And, and then environmental justice is really just, um, uh, you know, just making sure that there's kind of equitable responsibility um, spread across um, demographics, racial groups. Um, and so we felt that like it might be a 
way to kind of communicate the importance of, of um, green initiatives to the larger community, especially during a time when you know, Black Lives Matter um, has really come to the forefront of the public's eye. And so anyway, here's, here's a little bit of information on that that I collected. And so the report that I'm referencing here is from the EPA just came out um, and it's, uh, um, it shows the disproportionate uh, impacts of climate change on socially vulnerable populations in the US. And so I'm, I'm just gonna summarize a couple key findings here uh, with a two degree uh, Celsius uh, global warming temp rise. Um, it's expected that black, black and African uh, American individuals are 34% more likely to currently live in areas with the highest projected increase in childhood asthma and 40% more likely to live in areas with the highest projected increases in extreme temp related deaths. And then these get worse under the four uh, degree Celsius temporized scenario. So then similarly with a um, two degree uh, centigrade global temp rise, uh, Hispanics and Latinos are- I'm gonna, yes. I'm gonna just a quick thing. Yeah. Uh, Gino, you need to let in somebody. Oh, two people actually. Thank you, oh. Michael. Frank. Uh, and oh. I'm gonna oh. pause you to just introduce Two people. Is it Grizel and uh, and Frank? Yes. So I'll pause. Just introduce these. Um, uh, let's see. Are they in yet? Or yeah, they sh they're getting there. They're Frank's getting there. in. Yep. Thank you. Okay, we got. Uh, hi, Grizel. Nice to see you face to face. And uh, and I see Frank there. Hello. Uh, it's Sorry for being late. Life, so oh, many nice. things, exciting yeah. things at this time. Yes, there you go. That's a good, <laughs> good excuse. Uh, so Frank and Grizel, I've talked to both of them, and they're interested in the uh, in joining the uh, the committee. And uh, to which I've said, fine, come to the meetings, see what work you want to do, and uh, and join uh, and just participate. Um, <laughs> As we can see here, what I'm going to not say much more now, since we're in the middle, uh, what you see in the, for Frank and Grizel, you see uh, Gino Carlucci and Dorothea von Herder, who are basically our sustainability coordinators. And then there is uh, Tom, Fred split up in two phone calls because he can't have trouble, and, uh, <laughs> and Andy are, and myself are the uh, four members of the committee. And Brad has applied and has been attending meetings for quite a while now and is about to uh, present something on environmental justice. Um, so we can talk more, but let's let, we'll let, uh, we'll go back to Fred. Welcome to the two of you and feel free to participate as if you're just part of the committee. Um, and, and Brad, you can uh, take it away. Okay, thanks, Michael. Welcome, uh, Frank and Grizel. Um, and this is this is only really my first uh, slide with meat on it. Um, so, so you're getting here at a good time. Um, and so then, uh, with a uh, two degree centigrade uh, global warming temp rise, uh, it's expected that Hispanic and Latino individuals are 43 percent more likely to currently live in places with the highest projected reductions in labor hours due to extreme temperature and about 50% more likely to currently live in areas with the highest estimated increases in traffic delays due to increased coastal flooding. This is a huge report, actually. It's, it's over 100 pages. Oh, wow. um, mm -hmm. And so I give the, the lay summary link as well as the, the full scientific report link if you want to go over it more. But I'm just kind of setting the stage for, you know, um, giving an understanding of, of how, you know, climate change um, will impact um, uh, minority populations and, um, you know, just various demographics, more vulnerable demographics. And so then, you know, trying to dig into like more local data, I was actually able to dig up this recent study from Goldstein uh, et al. Uh, from 2020. And, um, they found that, uh, and this isn't surprising, like a lot of this information that I'm gonna present is really, to me, it's very logically mm -hmm. um, apparent, um, you know, to connect these dots, but it's just kind of nice to have some, some hard data um, to, to back up all of our, you know, um, suspicions. Um, 
And so the, the headline from the, um, from the lay summary from the Associated Press was that rich Americans spew more carbon pollution at home than poor. And conveniently enough, one of the, um, the areas that he, he analyzed uh, was the greater Boston area. And so this kind of jumps out um, with the red box is they compared Sudbury, Massachusetts to Dorchester mm -hmm. um, in terms of the uh, typical pounds of carbon dioxide emitted on an annual basis per capita per person. Um, and they kind of correlated this with average income. And the, um, the methods in the study were generally speaking based on um, heating degree days in you know, the area that people live, as well as square footage of homes, as well as you know, what were the, the popular form, what are the popular forms of, of uh, fuel for heating homes or you know, what's powering the energy grid. And so based on, on that information, he was able to kind of model the um, expected uh, per capita um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis uh, for various areas, as well as uh, average income, which really correlated strongly. And so here's just a couple um, key points, um, uh, key quotes from the authors is that wealthy, uh, wealthier Americans have per capita footprints about 25% higher than those of lower income residents, primarily due to larger homes. And in especially affluent suburbs, these emissions can be as much as 15 times higher than nearby neighborhoods, which is pretty wild. So here's a cool figure. Um, and you know, apologies for moving fast. The slides are available. I just don't want to take up too much time. Um, and so here's a heat map of the uh, on an annual base, on an annual per capita basis, uh, tons of, of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and so, you know, to me, Sudbury is pretty interchangeable with uh, Sherborne. And so, what you're seeing here on the left is just um, uh, a trend line uh, relating greenhouse gas emissions to income. And the x-axis is, uh, I think they made an error here. This, this a zero must have gotten cut off, and this is probably nine k to. $130,000 um, per year. Um, and um, then they show it by population density as well as distance to downtown. So you can see where the hot spots are, where you know there's there's the highest level of greenhouse gas emissions per capita. So I ended up, what I ended up doing, I tried to first overlay um, a uh, like a Google map with Sherborne, I couldn't do it. I was messing around for a while with transparency and everything. But what I was able to find is that's Farm Pond right there. <laughs> and so <laughs> that that is a great marker for Sherborne. Whenever you're looking at mapping, that's that's. Uh, can can I ask you a question while I'm going to you interrupted here? Yeah, yeah. Is this heat map from the EPA study or from somewhere else? No, this is the Goldstein et al. study. And um, okay, okay. And I do provide a link for this. There's the lay summary. This is a couple slides later, but there's the lay summary, yeah. and then there's the scientific manuscript. Very good. And then the supplemental material in the manuscript. It, it's like an all-day read, and I haven't gone through it all. Mm. But um, and I've I've read through the manuscript, but it, I, I still I haven't fully digested the methods yet. Anyways. So, so here's Sherborne. So, you know, we're lit up pretty well. Um, just to give you a sense of like, you know, on average, what we're contributing um, for greenhouse gas emissions on a per capita basis. And, you know, I wonder if they took into account oil, how we, you know, so many of us heat with oil. It could be even worse than that. Um, and so he took some kind of, um, I think average, you know, prototypical neighborhoods um, these might truly exist. I think it's still kind of generally model data. I don't think this is empirical, um, empirical greenhouse gas emissions for each of these homes. I think it's probably based on square footage, on their source of heating, um, and how many residents are living in those homes. Um, but it's just again, you know, kind of comparing Sudbury to Dorchester, you know, with you know the expectation that Sherborne could swap in pretty easily for Sudbury to give you a sense of you know. The average Sherborne resident and what we're contributing uh, due to our homes. And so here's the links to that data um, if you want to, you know, do a deeper dive into it. And so then this kind of got me thinking about like, you know, how do we share these results with like the broader community? Because like there's our own little population here where, you know, we're very interested in, you know, making green decisions, you know, for various reasons. But 
I don't know if it's, you know, if sharing this information would necessarily get everyone motivated. It probably wouldn't be. And conveniently enough, you know, where I work, a lot of research comes across my desk. And this, this one um, article came across just last week uh, by Exley and Kessler. Uh, and this is 2021. So it's, it's, it's very new. And it's, uh, the topic was information avoidance and image concerns. And they kind of contextualized it with the climate crisis a little bit. And so briefly, what they sought to do is just test the common hypothesis that people strategically avoid info to maintain beliefs and support their actions, for example, selfish behavior for the sake of image concerns. And what they found was, um, you know, to quote, a surprisingly large degree of information avoidance doesn't appear to be related to excuse driven motives. Uh, and so in other words, like image concerns play a role, but a smaller one than expected, which they summarized is about 20 to 35% in information avoidance. And the other reasons include desire to avoid interpersonal interpersonal trade-offs, desire to avoid bad news, laziness and attention and confusion. And so I just wanted to use this information to figure out like what's the best way, you know, that we can share, you know, environmental justice information as well as all sorts of other information. And uh, just to pull one more quote from the, uh, from the paper, they said that, um, or, or rather the, uh, the lay summary. Um, one of the authors said that subtle changes to how you make information available can have a substantial impact on whether people choose to acquire that information. Mm -hmm. And so how do we implement this knowledge with marketing climate friendly choices? So my expectation is we probably shouldn't try to guilt trip people into decisions, um, which likely only works with a small proportion of the population we're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. And um, it's probably really important to identify why green choices benefit those individuals that we're trying to market to. For example, you know, cost savings, comfort, low maintenance, less noise, increase in floor space, et cetera. And that's not to say we still shouldn't inform them as to how their green decisions have a greater impact beyond themselves, but maybe this becomes less of an emphasized point. And so, so that's my spiel on the environmental justice front. That's what I got so far. That, Brad, that's honest, fascinating. And Brad, may I uh, ask a question? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Tom. Go ahead. You go ahead, Ian. You probably have a better question. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, you know, I, I, Brad, I, I worked at EPA for 35 years. And in the early years, um, EPA was criticized rightfully for um, trying to uh, only concentrate on the pristine areas and keeping them pristine. And then environmental justice, you know, became more of an issue, um, you know, say maybe in the last 15 years or so, and, rightful, and rightfully so. Uh, and what you have presented is absolutely no surprise uh, at all. And, and including the last part of it, uh, part of it about communications. Um, and I feel that Sherborne and communities uh, of some significant affluence have an obligation to um, partner with or do whatever is necessary or possible to improve the environmental quality in those communities that um, you know, are impacted the most. Uh, that is those communities usually of um, minority populations. Um, and I don't know the answer to it, um, but I, I think that it, you know, instead of just focusing on what we can do in Sherborne to lower our carbon footprint, yes, of course, everybody benefits from that. But I think we should kind of come up with some ideas and maybe work with lots of other communities as to what can be done um, regionally to uh, improve environmental quality in, in those impacted communities. Yeah, I mean, it's all interconnected. I, I agree, uh, Andrew. Um, and, and as you see, you know, the hotspots are, are the affluent communities. I mean, you know, again, on a per capita basis, it looks like, you know, that's where the, um, uh, well, actually that's a per capita basis. 
Um, whereas if you were to just look at like, where is the output most happening on a um, geographical basis, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's, that's a, I guess a little bit of a different situation. Um, but no, good points. Um, and, you know, as, as more affluent communities, you know, we can, we can take the hit more when, when, you know, there are disruptions and we can also, you know, we, we have the resources to, to make the adjustments easier. Um, right. It's just communicating that I think is going to be a little bit tricky. Right. And, you know, and communication alone, I don't know. I just view that as, you know, it's good. as you point out, it's going to fall on deaf ears for the most part. It's not going to probably alter people's lifestyle changes that are necessary to lower carbon footprint. Um, and I, I, I just would like to see more action, something more si significant done to improve the environmental qualities, uh, not just in Sherborne, but even more importantly, in those neighboring communities. Um, I, I would agree, uh, Andy and uh, Brad. Thank you very much for uh, putting this together and uh, okay. highlighting this stuff. You know, it's only recently that I started to uh, better appreciate some of these things. You know, I think we all understood that, like uh, air pollution, impacted uh, inner cities more. They're right on the highways and, and uh, concentrated uh, population density. But there's so many other environmental factors like heat islands from all the concrete and pavement and uh, impervious surfaces and uh, uh, flooding. You know, I was involved in that the flooding uh, modeling project. I learned a lot about how uh, flooding uh, really, really is affecting, you know, all the older eastern cities are built either on harbors of fill or on rivers. And again, the inner cities are located in the flood zone. So I think uh, to uh, respond to your concern about communications, uh, and, and I'm sure Dorothy is already thinking along these lines, getting some of this information on the uh, uh, energy and sustainability uh, town website, you know, just start educating people about these huge uh, differences. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going yeah, to let Frank has actually raised his hand. Um, He's so polite. I have a comment too, but I'll let him, uh, why, don't you, why don't you speak, Frank, before I have a comment on some practical steps. Go on. So um, since I'm a new member, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this very uh, brief, but I just wanted to say that I, I, maybe it's more of a question. I, I, I agree with what, what, what Tom says about the hotspots and, and all the things that the bigger cities have. And it's, it's also showing from your um, data that the, the, the suburbs are, are producing more greenhouse gases. But does, were you able to see in there at all, Brad, if there was any um, offset for the, the greenery, the, the number of trees that we have to absorb some of that, uh, that, that greenhouse gas and does, does it give a net for that? So um, I don't, it's a good point. I don't think that trees were factored into the models uh, uh, for a station. Um, I mean, going back to an earlier point about the, the, the heat islands is, is, you know, that, yeah, that's absolutely a, a contributing factor. It's a, it's a, it's a feedback loop. Um, you know, as things warm, you know, it's those urban areas that are going to get hit harder due to that urban you know, heat island effect. Um, so I, I, at least for my own personal data, um, you know, due to my solar panels is um, the, you know, trees are great, but when you compare it, uh, what a tree can consume in carbon dioxide to even like a single solar panel on it on a yearly basis, it's like the, the tree barely makes a dent compared to the solar panel. Um, that's, that's not to say that, you know, they don't have all sorts of benefits. My expectation though, based on, you know, what I've seen is that the trees aren't gonna have as big of an impact as, as we hope they would. And I think what's more important is just to look towards, um, you know, disentangling ourselves from fossil fuels. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. I mean, 
even if we have lots of trees, that doesn't really help us in like justifying uh, what we're doing with these large homes and the two to three cars. It's, it is what it is, what we're doing uh, as humans, right? Whether we have parks or live in a, in a rural or in an urban setting, it's about what we do and what we drive and how we heat and how we eat. Um, and to talk about that and the connection that it has to people that don't have means is, is an issue, but I have no solution for that because I think uh, the only people in Sherborne that are thinking about it along these lines are the Unitarians in town. And they have, have already reached out to Framingham for various um, um, projects, including um, immigration support, um, including, um, I think they're doing something with like a hunger alle alleviation. And that's their way to contribute to put people in a better spot. But that doesn't necessarily um, mean that people will decrease um, their carbon footprint. Yeah, I, I agree, Dorothy. And that's, that's kind of why, you know, I figured yeah, there is that small that subset that we can yeah. that that we can catch their ear with you know talk of environmental justice. But I feel like for the for the larger population, it's it's this point right here, which mm -hmm. is like, how do we get people signed on? It's right. Like, well, you switch over from oil to you know to heat pumps after you do insulation, and we'll get you saving money. Um, you know, on, on a long-term basis, potentially even, you know, on a near-term basis, depending on your specific scenario, mm -hmm. you know, you, we have a set it and forget it type of situation with, with heat pumps where like, I keep the same temperature all winter long and, you know, low maintenance, there's no, you know, annual maintenance to come in and clean the oil filters or anything. I gain space, like my old, my oil tank's gone, my boiler's gone. Um, there's less noise. You know, I don't hear the 50 year old boiler firing up anymore. And this is just, you know, I'm, you know, talking about homes, but of course, you know, there's the whole EV thing too. So I was just thinking, you know, maybe this is this is the angle that we have to use with with the larger segment of the population. Yeah. Before uh, I see I see your raised hand there, Giselle. Uh, but I'll I'll just make a two cents of in terms of how we move forward on this topic. Um, uh, I'm going to just offer some thoughts that whether the, uh, I think on our website as to the last point on the communication slide is whether we just need to have something on the website that at least brings up the environmental justice issues in a summary way of just saying that not only does it, not only does mitigation and, uh, and addressing climate change help uh, in some broader way that it has a disproportionate benefit to, uh, to others um, and so that there is a broader benefit and a that can come about by doing our actions so that people realize that it's, it gets in a sense, double action um, in terms of environmental justice communities in terms of they are gonna pay more of a price so they can have more of a benefit in the way of if we do things. And so whether we just put a little, some educational work on our website on this issue and then whether the other more concrete thing is I'm not sure how much we can really do grant proposals and other things on the climate change with others, but there could be work if somebody wants to do it, whether we could also have a, an advocacy side where we could have more practical things where we find environmental justice issues that are climate change or sustainability change that we actually also list on the website. For example, the Springfield biomass plant that people are putting up. There was a lot of political action around the fact that Springfield is the asthma capital of the world uh, or of the US and that they were getting people and I did some of myself, I didn't think to bring it up to the group where signing petitions and writing to people at the state level to say that the biomass plant is not really renewable. Uh, one could say it's not renewable, but it also has, even if it has some renewable energy factors, it basically has such a heavy cost in terms of local air pollution, that it's not a worthy project in terms of that kind of impact and that there could be other issues such as some people argue with the, uh, even the gas compressor sites where they're being located in neighborhoods that they could, we could collect 
and put on the website areas and be part of a newsletter, specific issues in the state and the area where people could do some advocacy that would have some uh, benefit beyond our town and, and help with environmental justice. And so that would be the second thing that I think we could try to collect and put on the website and put in every newsletter that goes out might have, here's an, here's an issue, a broader issue that people can actually write. Here's where you can sign up and write in. So that's a practical step that I think we could do beyond just education. So those are the two things uh, that I'd like to see done if we have the time and whatever. And I'll let Brazil and Gino go. Hello, everybody. Nice meeting you all, finally. Hi. Um, it is I, all this time that we, we, you've been talking, I, I am stuck um, in the mindset that how do we communicate this to people? How are we proactive? That, that's all that was in my mind. Because there are the ones like us, you know, that we're very interested, we're, we want to do more. Um, but there's a lot of people that it might not be unfortunately like accepted or not it might not even be in their radar that this might be something that they never think about talk about and in my mind I, i'm just thinking how can we make them know you know how can we provide the, all this information to them they, they're not the ones that are going to go to the website to look for the information although we should do that for sure um but there are the people that are, you know, we might see in Farm Pond or like in any events that we have here and they have to, there's gotta be a way to just put it in, in front of them. Like, oh, this is happening. You know, this, this is important information. So, um, and, and along those lines and I'm, I'm, everything that you have there in the presentation in the slide, yeah, how do we make it easy for them to understand? To understand what's happening, what's the effect of of our daily life on you know on the carbon footprint and our lives and future generations, right? So how do we make it simple? I know of, we like the data, and you know you are very technical people. I can see that. <laughs> My background is engineering, by the way, so I tend to be a technical person too. But it has nothing to do with the environment; I'm more in manufacturing. What is the manufacturing aspect of it, right? Um, but to the person that is not as technical, that they just want to know what's happening and how does this affect me? What's in it for me to make a change? To so how how is this gonna affect me or my family? Sometimes it's not even about them; it's their family, their kids, how they're gonna be affected by it. By, um, by our actions, our daily actions. And also I was thinking, Michael, along those lines, I think you, meant, you also mentioned on how do we connect with other towns? And I know Dorothea, but um, based on our conversation today that you have some, you know, some people here and there that, you know, at least our surroundings can be connected, but on the same token, like how do we promote this maybe in other towns because I know there's a lot to do in Sherburne, it seems like, right? Um, so we need to start somewhere, but also can we connect with, with other, how do we connect with other towns around us? So we can also, you know, some, some of the people that live here in Sherburne might go to the native markets on Saturdays, you know? So that might be a place to have that information in front of them or whatnot. So once again, all, all this time, I'm just thinking about which local events there are, around us, not just in Sherburne, but around us in other towns. And how can we provide this information in a very simple way so people understand what's going on? Um, I'll leave it like that. <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> just thoughts. Mm -hmm. Gino and then Dorothea, go. OK, um, I just wanted to comment that I think in, we should look at environmental justice in uh, two, from two perspectives, the global perspective where, of course, anything we do to mitigate climate change will be a benefit, but also environmental justice communities have uh, defined with specific criteria based on income, ethnicity, and language. And while we don't have any environmental justice communities within Sherbert, we do have them in Framingham, literally right across the border from us. And as we 
contemplate actions we can take to reduce their impact, we need to keep that in mind that we have populations very close to us that um, uh, whether we work with Framingham on, on helping them or, or whatever actions we take, we, we do have environmental justice communities that will be impacted by what we do right close by. Mm -hmm. That's Dorothea, go ahead. Just go ahead, many hands. And then Fred, just plow in. Yeah. I keep it short this time because I just wanted to um, point to solutions and, and build on what Gino just said. Yes, if we want to do something and connect our constituents in Sherborne to meaningful action in regards to environmental justice, I think Framingham is, is the community we should look to. And I wanted to mention that I think John Higley and I, and this was back um, probably summer of last year, where I reached out to Sean Luz, the um, sustainability manager of Framingham, to think about how we can connect, I think, uh, a bicycle um, tra trail from uh, Sherborne and Framingham. Um, do you know, isn't there a trail that can be the, built? The, the Upper Charles Trail, yes. We, we just completed our connection to it in off Whitney Street. There's a northern section that goes from Sherborne into Framingham. Yeah. And that, that's in the works. We have uh, a group working on that already. And excuse me, um, Gino, doesn't that trail just go south right now? I, I know that there is uh, a link that continues north from Whitney Avenue, but it's not completed at all. No, not at all. Not at all. That's what we're working on. It's still, in fact, still owned by CSX. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but th there's, there's a plan to continue that to go north to Framingham? Yes. Okay. And you know that Natick and Framingham just constructed that one path right. that links the two towns as well. Exactly. So coming back to my point is like, if we wanted to do something, then it's Framingham. And um, I already re uh, reached out to, to Sean if we could do some high school programs together um, that will gear towards environmental justice and also bring in the Unitarian Church, because I know the Unitarians work across um, town lines um, to do these kind of programs. And I think, uh, at least I know this from Barbie Breer, they are currently the environmental um, I want to say committee, but that's the wrong word, in the church is not having a, a chairperson. So they're looking for somebody to fill that position. And I think uh, that's something that could be of big value for, for us if that's driven, that's, that mission is driven by a community that has that as a value, like caring for others. Dorothy, two of the other churches, both Pilgrims and uh, uh, St. Teresa's are, are uh, you know, over the years have, have different programs with uh, mm -hmm. some, some of the uh, challenged, uh, 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 you know, sister uh, churches and, and cities in the area. So I think all the, all the churches could, could be potential uh, help here. I agree, Tom, and the Unitarians are the one that have already like um, the disadvantaged um, immigrant population in Framingham uh, is on their on their larger kind of like radar. Great. So, um, we should reach out to all churches and I can look into that, but we need to first frame frame what we really want to do because uh, Ultimately, it's going to be people want to connect to other people to make their lives better. And the question is, where's the need? And who is going to, to identify that need and going to drive people to, to do action in that regard? And uh, I don't think, generally speaking, if the, it's a large topic, environmental justice, to just have it end up on my website as a side bullet point is not what we want. We want people with feet on the ground connecting with Framingham and running a program 
and running awareness. And I think that needs to be defined by a group of, of either young people or church people or anybody else who wants to jump to that and make a difference and frame how they want to do it. Yeah, but Dorothy, I want to just go back to, there's got to be things that can be done across a town border that's more than just education. You know, uh, I'm just not that optimistic that getting a message out is going to change people's habits. Um, and, and Brad made that point, I think, or showed that point in, in that Goldstein study. I, you know, and I'm wondering, Dorothea, with your uh, education at, you know, at, at Harvard in environmental studies, I know there's a lot of work that they've done on regional planning that more than just education, there's got to be things that can be done or maybe you see if we can enlist them to assist you know, wealthier communities to help poorer communities deal with environmental quality issues. Um, I just think a lot of time, yeah, it's important to get a message out. I'm, I'm not totally putting that down, but you know, it's just, I haven't seen that much coming from the, those efforts. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Let's yeah, right. let's... If I could, if I could jump in for just yes. a minute. Um, okay, good. My audio is on. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I thought was that as we find actual action, I'm totally with you, Andy. Uh, the education part is good, but it's not sufficient. Um, as we find actions, couldn't we integrate them into our mass energized site so that because that's action oriented, it's not just information oriented. So I just wanted idea. to throw that in that we keep that in mind. That's a good idea, Fred. That's a good idea. But I think we need help and direction from maybe academics to who have a good idea as to what can be done. Um, yeah, I know that it's for instance, the Harvard, carbon, school, right? Harvard School of Public Health worked with the T in rerouting bus, bus routes out of poor communities because kids were, had an extremely high level of asthma in those communities based in large part on bus exhausts. You know, the, in, instead of us trying to knock in our heads, trying to come up with ideas on our own, is there a way that we can enlist assistance from some of the great universities in, in this area? And, you know, and Michael, the same with MIT. I know they've done a lot of work uh, in this area, but. Well, are we gonna, are we gonna come up with, we could spend more time on this now. The question is whether I guess whether, to what extent we make it, somebody wants to make it a, a particular focus of their work. Sorry, I'm just choking on something. Um, mm -hmm. To uh, mm -hmm. figure out what the practical, what, what are practical actions that we can do besides, because I think we all, we all feel like education's nice, but it's, 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 it's of limited, it's of limited use in terms of our time. Um, and the question is, is whether somebody here or is willing to go investigate what it is that we can take as actions uh, that do this beyond the only practical one, as I said before, that I could see is some political action around identifying issues in the, around the state or in the region that we can do some advocacy on. Um, and I think the bio, like the Springfield plant, I think has already been uh, put off. So that was successful, uh, whether the natural gas uh, uh, compression station or even just people do advocacy around uh, uh, the fact that they wanna put a new natural gas pipeline to bring more gas into New England is a sort of a regional issue um, that basically says, but that's not necessarily environmental justice, that's again, a mitigation issue. Um, but whether somebody here wants to do that. Um, before, before. There, I just had another suggestion. Um, 
many years ago, I had a grant in the city of New Orleans to do a pilot project in low income areas, uh, weather, weatherization for low income people, where we, monitor, we, we, we got records of their utility bills for the previous 12 months that did the weatherization and then monitored the difference over the following 12 months and then publicized the results. I mean, just now we have mass save that can do some of that without a grant. But, but uh, just just one thought on on uh, on the local environmental justice aspect of uh, uh, in Framingham is maybe we could encourage Framingham to do something like that and participate with them. I mean, unless we want to support more of that, other people and by the right to some extent, as I see it, I'll comment whether what Brad meant of whether environmental justice is a very large topic that I see many tentacles of it extend beyond necessarily what I would say our energy and sustainability committee might want to do um, or what resources we have amongst ourselves to actually do things. I don't know where to draw a line there, but I guess it comes back to what somebody here wants to do. I mean, it comes back to uh, what the group of us want, who wants to do something or who wants to go find somebody else who really wants to do it, whether it's the case of whether with Dorothea saying that, can we find, uh, is this a topic that somebody at the schools, um, let's say at the, whether they consider part of the environmental group or the sustainability group where they wanna see whether there's some particular actions that they could come up with and come back to us to see whether how much we want to advocate or they could advocate on their own. But I see it as a, uh, as a, as whether the next step is who wants to do something on it because, uh, and how much or how much time do we want to spend talking about it as a group right now, just to be real explicit about what's, how much more do we want to talk about it now versus somebody wants to take on a topic or there's a few little things that people are gonna follow up and come back to the committee with after some period of time. I'm just trying to figure out what's the practical next step to use uh, to use our committee time fruitfully. Um, and before we even, I say, how do we end this topic? May, uh, must we might, on? might I suggest, I think it's a, a very timely and important topic, but obviously we've got a lot of other stuff to cover today. Uh, just leave it open till next meeting. Let people think about what uh, role they might want to play. Yeah, we can leave it as open ended as that. That's my know. suggestion. Grizel, were you gonna? What were you gonna say since you? Well, like I just I was because I'm totally new. I know we've went through some information before, Michael, and I know there's like a big list of different items. I just I'm assuming at this point that environmental justice is like one of them, maybe the main one that you're addressing or trying to address right now. And then there's gonna be other topics that um, whenever we meet, we're gonna discuss and do something like this, try to figure out what, what are the actions for the different members to take. Is that correct? Is that what we're trying to do with these meetings? <laughs> well, this meeting, we actually had other topics that were even higher, but it's a matter of how you define environmental justice uh, and how broadly you define it. Right now, it's a matter of, uh, of that it's, it's a new topic and we were much more focused on straightforward mitigation issues and on other things within that we could do in Sherborne with residents and with the town operations and the environmental justice components of those are fairly small other than the fact that to the extent that we do something uh, that it helps the world as a whole. But in terms of being more targeted to environmental justice, more focused, it's a new topic that basically we have to figure out whether there's things we wanna do or somebody wants to do. Um, and so it's new in that sense. Uh, and even though others have been talking about it. Um, so it's just a matter of how much we leave this meeting right now with think about it more, we put it on next week's agenda and we uh, and see if any heavy, anybody, what brain, uh, brain, smart things people have come up with that they wanna do or something. And I'll let Andy talk who's standing there. Thanks, Michael. Uh, um, I just have a very short suggestion. And that is, I agree with Tom that perhaps we've spent enough time on this, discuss on this topic today. Um, before we just table it though, um, to the next one. I think we should all think about for discussion at the next meeting, 
what we can do, who, who we can reach out to, to get some ideas on what wealthier communities can do to improve the environmental quality in neighboring poorer communities. Um, and I'll, I will contact people at EPA doing environmental justice for them. And I'll contact um, a, uh, an academic in the, in the field on regional environmental planning. Um, and perhaps the rest of you or some of you um, have contacts as well. And we should just ask them and we can come back at the next meeting with some more concrete um, proposals. Makes sense. And yeah, and we can bring up the issue of whether, I mean, it's not on this agenda, whether at some point related to uh, the mass save program um, and what Gino said, I think was there that we do have this uh, MOU with uh, All in Energy, which is a group that's pr trying to promote energy audit work uh, through mass save in environmental justice communities. And we could actually figure out whether we even bring somebody from that group in just to see what it means yeah. to uh, exactly. as, a, as, a, uh, as a practical step to help promote that there. In theory, we're trying to help by working with them and, and focusing all of our mass save audits through this group, they get a little they get a little fee for every one that they refer to a uh, for a mass save audit. So part of the logic in working with this nonprofit is that we're helping that group by the extent that we could funnel more and more mass save audits through them. They get a little bit of a fee. It also generates a little bit more internal employment for them. Uh, and they even like the fact that just dealing with the kind of concerns we had for those for figuring out how what kind of audits to do, they like the training implications for their staff. Um, so, so there's a, there's a specific avenue there that we could probably try to bring them in and see whether, and, and to what extent it's a matter of us giving time in other communities. It's not necessarily, necessarily a committee thing, um, or whether, as we, somebody said, maybe it's a, uh, we can come up with actions that we could promote through the, uh, through the mass energize through the tech action site, um, that it becomes something we could just try to get people to be more broadly placed in their actions. Um, whatever, we'll all think about it. So we're gonna leave it with, uh, people are gonna see who they could talk to to see what specifics might make sense, reach out to people and we'll put it on the agenda for next week and, and go from there. And Dorothy, you can get the last word in. Um, I, do, I, I just wanted, um, a question came to my mind, which is more technical. Um, Brad is not yet a committee member, right? And how about Frank? Frank, are, you, you mentioned you're already a member or did I get this wrong? No, no, there's only four, no, there's only four of us at the moment. Okay. Uh, is a logistic issue that you had. Okay. Is Frank, uh, Frank, are you going to apply for, for being a member of the ESC? I wish I had already been appointed. I don't know how I could become a member, but I want to become one as soon as possible. That's very good. It's nice to hear. And what's the point? Where are you going with that? Oh, Dorothea. Yeah, I'm just um, maybe the point, I'm, that's a technical question because I thought I, I heard Frank saying he's, he's part of the committee, but I just wanted to know if that's already the fact, if he has been appointed. Yes, I guess you could be. As I've said, not to be cagey, as I've said to probably Grizel and to Frank, mm -hmm. as I've seen with other committees, it's basically been, uh, we, I mean, we don't have a fixed number of slots. I basically said to people, come and join the committee and start doing work with the committee and, uh, and sort of, uh, I don't know, this might be a very poor verb to use and you can yell at me, sort of earn a spot on the committee by doing stuff. Uh, and, and showing up at meetings um, and that that's part of a that's part of the stepping stones uh, now obviously people could just go to straight to the select board and get appointed we're appointed by them I've just suggested to people that there's not much there's not much difference between participating in a committee discussion like we have now and being a member we don't vote on a lot of things it's all a matter of what we all want to do so any of you here 
there's not much difference between being a formal member and just attending the meeting and speaking up and, and having your say. I've just put a little of that extra, whether it's inappropriate of me, others can disagree that I'd like to say that people show up to meetings and do work as part of joining the committee. Um, and that um, that's part of the way I think. Um, but I'll just say to both Brazil and Frank, any either of you and anybody else could just go straight to the select board and say they want to get appointed to this committee um, and apply. Um, so I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but yes, doesn't make much of a difference uh, at this level. Except to say that you have to um, you actually have to fill out a form which is on the website. So it's oh. not just showing up at the select board, it's filling out the form and applying. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, uh, I, Andy, are you talking to us? You're muted. Um, right. There we go. I, I just wanted to add to that, Michael, that I think it helps an applicant to have the backing of the existing committee supporting that application. So, I, I think we should help Frank and Grissel and uh, Brad's already a member, but and oh, anybody, yeah. oh, and Brad as well, and anybody else, you know, that if, if we either through email or whatever uh, supported an application, I think it pushes it along in the select board, uh, you know, more effectively. And I think we should do that. Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, you could disagree with me. I've pushed people to just sort of come and attend for a while because once you join, um, it becomes part of a member, it becomes part of the quorum issue and everything else and, and having discussions. I want to make sure people really have the time to show up yes. And, yes. And, and show that they're showing up over time before they, at least for me, before I want to support people. I mean, the rest I, of you I, can I support people ahead of time and right. and be different. I'm just speaking my own senses that uh, for myself only, as opposed to one as one member, um, right. that I would like to see people showing up and participating for some period, of, some set of meetings, because there is a responsibility there and there is some issue around uh, that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good joining. point. So that's, that's all. Point. That's all I meant by it. I don't mean I don't want much of a hurdle. I certainly want more people. But I just want more people who will participate and do work. Um, and so that's why I don't think it's much of an issue if somebody particularly really wants to just become part of a member. Without that, they can certainly uh, apply and, and talk to us about it that way. Um, but that's been my, my way of talking about it. You, and, you Andy, Tom, Fred, who are existing members, uh, and Brad, who's already applied and will sort of come up soon for a vote, I imagine, um, uh, can have your own view about how you want to encourage people. No, I, I understand your point, Michael. Well taken. Um, however, at some point, I think just leaving it to a to a, a person to. Oh, no, I, I agree that we would want to help on his or her own is. Oh, without a doubt, that's. Um, Agreed. Uh, okay, it's 4.33. Um, okay. I'm going to suggest that, um, Brad, I'm going to put you off for the next topic that you had. Um, I'd like to move on to the, uh, um, uh, before I go on whether Gino or Dor Dorothy has not been around, while I pull up the spreadsheet again, whether Gino, you have any updates on any grants, new potential existing ones? Whether you want to give us an update on things while I uh, share my screen. Sure. The uh, Green Communities is finally supposed to be announced by the end of the month. Oh, cool. So um, we can get moving on that. And in fact, I did meet with DOER and uh, Guardian uh, earlier this week about getting those projects going. The charging station still has not had the meter installed. So it's not active yet. Um, I don't know what the holdup is, but I'll, I'll plan to check on that this this week. You and know, can, I apologize. Can I back you up to green communities? Yeah. Is there money involved? Did we get money or what? What? what oh, uh, yes. Does that mean? Definitely money. Money. How much? 
70, 78,000, I believe. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. That's money for street light, half, about half, almost half is for street lights. And then there's some other weatherization of buildings. And I guess there's yeah. a, a chunk for the town hall insulation project. Yeah, that's Great. what the bulk of it is the street lights and the town hall weatherization and also weatherization at uh, DPW garage. Those are the three. Mm -hmm. three Fantastic. Uh, the, uh, the geothermal study should be, um, well, I actually have not been in contact with the uh, consultant uh, recently, but uh, the last communication, he thought September or October, he would have it wrapped up. So that's nearing completion. Okay. Um, this, what you share, see on the screen there is uh, the same thing that I had last time. It's just gets a little bit changed. Um, I mean, sometimes we'd like to, we were thinking of using this as sort of the, like that current could do's thing, to do's, excuse me, mm -hmm. as a way of, uh, of running down through where things are. Um, and I can't tell whether to, I'm not gonna do it now because one of the things that we've been putting off is a little, because this was part of trying to figure out what it is we wanna do. Um, and what's highlighted in yellow is something we can't, we, we've a number of times we've tried to just have a meeting where we just sort of make a major thrust on working on what we're doing with the town outreach between the website and the work Dorothy is doing and and what we want to do just to figure out what it is that she's spearheading with that as well as and what kind of help or or what or what areas do I, any of us want to work on that that fall into that bailiwick that in a way she's overseeing. So I'd like to just, I don't know what people's time constraints are. How many people have time constraints of five o'clock? Um, Muted. I, I have a time constraint, not at the strike of five, but you know, within five minutes or so after. Okay, um, and I, I more importantly, I saw Dorothy hold up her hand too. Yeah, I, I have, um, as I have visitors, but um, I'd be happy to stay around a little bit longer if needed. Okay, let's just start plowing ahead with this topic of what it is we're doing with the town between the town website and reaching out, whether we want to do any programs. I don't know how we want to do this, whether Dorothy, you want to give your vision of what you were gonna do, what you see yourself as doing over the next uh, few months um, with, uh, with your time and, and overall and in this area and to see how people wanna, where you'd like help or what, what people wanna help on that mm -hmm. kind of back and forth. So I'm thinking about um, the last time we spoke uh, in July, um, we have a regional climate, climate program going on um, with several communities. Uh, remember that a technical assistant grant by MAPC was um, in the workings, so to speak. I haven't heard back yet from our native sustainability manager uh, Jillian where that stands, but I'm expecting, and the time frame for that was that the fall was the period that we we're going to basically craft an RFP to look for um, vendors and systems to be in the uh, RFP for, to basically, um, find a way how we can craft an RFP for 10 towns to find um, vendors of home um, of air source heat pumps, solar, and a couple of other mechanical, uh, mechanical solutions. And that is something that I was planning to focus on, uh, including with um, the work that we are trying to do at the schools, which is um, outreach, to the elementary school and to the regional schools for uh, finding ways how we can communicate to residents about uh, the two big topics we have here. 
which is green transportation, like switching to hybrids and electrical cars and to get the homes in better shape. And these will be uh, programs that I will put together over the fall with um, the students and with parents and teachers that raise their hand to be part of that. So I will need help with that. And uh, Brad was just mentioning in the chat that he would be help would be helping with the residential outreach. I have identified a couple of homeowners in um, Sherborne, Brad, um, Jerry Hahn, a couple of other people that might be uh, helping us in, in reaching out to put together maybe a tour where people can go to homes and do a tour and visit um, and get a tour of a house that has solar and air source heat pumps. Uh, at the same time, we're doing um, outreach with EVs. I know that Fred has um, organized EV shows in various towns and that will run, I think, through early October. And then we should follow up with more of that. Uh, Fred, can you, you have been dealing with that um, show. Can you give us a little bit of a rundown how far that has gotten in terms of like? There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> yes, um, there are actually going to be four shows. Two of them are tomorrow. Um, we've got a, just a car in um, uh, Celebrate Holliston, along with our legislative team that's going to have a table there. Then we're going to be in the Ashlands Car Show at uh, Kitty Fenwall. Um, there's 400 cars in that show. We've got eight, but there's like 400 cars in the show, so it should be a huge draw. And then we have two others planned uh, for a football night at Dover Sherburn High School, uh, Middle School mm -hmm. and uh, another one at the um, UUA Church uh, in Sherburn. So we have a total of I forget how many, I think uh, 30 cars, 30 or so cars in those three, in those four shows. So come along, have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> I will be definitely there uh, on the two events um, at the high school and the other one at the Unitarian Church. And this is my first basically face-to-face -face event. And I'm, um, I'm trying to connect to people and to explain what we're trying to, to do in town. Um, where we'll need help is, and I have to think about this more um, in depth, I have gotten a list of all EV and hybrid owners from the DOER in Sherborne, and I'd like to send them a letter asking them to basically uh, host like a Zoom where they talk about their experience um, and have that as a regular kind of like, let's say once a month, your Sherburn EV owner is open to ask or to answer the questions about this particular model. And I think this would be a good forum where Sherbonites can meet other Sherbonites. And for crafting that material or to host that regular, it would be great if one or another person on this committee, and Fred would be suited for that or somebody else, would be a co-host. So that would be a suggestion. And I can put together other stuff that I, I think would be um, effective. When you say other stuff, you're talking about just for the electric car outreach. Exactly. Yeah. For the electric car outreach. Because there needs to be two things. There need to be physical. People need to see these cars, and there needs to be also a forum where people can show up and ask questions. Right, and I guess we have to. I guess you're working on a, and whether anybody has other idea or whether so to speak, the whole PR, the whole PR issue of how to get people. Right. Like, like for example, I did. For for all, I mean, I'm not the best email reader. Uh, or how we get the word out, for example, like, I don't know, when is the DS school and the, uh, the church? One of those two. I'm going to actually send the flyer to everybody on the call mm -hmm. so that you can see it. Um, oh, that's it's good. It's been posted in a number of the newspapers and uh, next door Sherman will have another mm -hmm. reminder today, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been out there because, yeah, I haven't seen it, but I guess, right, I'm trying to figure out how to, how we do the outreach or for, 
right? How do we, how is it that we, um, whether we need to, right? What are the mechanisms? Well, we've gone, to, we've gone to the uh, Council of Aging, we've gone to um, Next Door Sherburne, Next Door Dover, Holliston, Ashland, um, newspapers, et cetera. So we tried to get the word out. Um, obviously, didn't work 100%. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course not. Um, but essentially, you guys have that, in a sense, that whole EV thing is covered, so to speak. Um, I'm trying to be certainly covered for this fall. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, if people hear about it in time, I guess I saw it on next door, but I didn't know there were uh, ones right in Sherborne, like at the church. So what's the date for the church? Well, hang on a second. Let me bring up the flyer so I can get it right because I've been shuffling things so much. I saw the Holliston thing, but I, I uh, tomorrow is not it. Okay, so um, celebrate okay. Holliston is tomorrow. Uh, and same Ashland Car Show is also tomorrow from one, 9 to 1. Um, then on September 24th is the middle school football game night. Mm -hmm. And then October 2nd, and I'll send this out to you in a minute. October 2nd is a UUA church in Sherburne um, from 10 to 2. But I'll, I'll send you all this right away. Um, as long as I keep up with the notes, I'll try and send it at the same time. No, we okay. um, focus on the notes. <laughs> so from a practical, okay. So from a practical sense, there's activity going on there that is sort of, you have what you need to do things that, um, I'm going to come back to, I'm trying to figure out how to be practical for the meeting sake in terms of people having where help is needed and figuring out because essentially, right, green cars is basically transportation is a major carbon emission emitter. And the best we're basically doing is trying to get people to just look at EVs and other kind of hybrids. And that's in a way that's the, the main thrust that we're doing, that we haven't come up with anything else to do on the, uh, on the transport side. Is that, is that I'm not meaning it as a criticism, just being, just being clear that that's, that's what we're doing for the EV side versus on the, uh, on the home residential use, let's say space conditioning and efficiency stuff. We have this, we, we have the work where we're trying to get identify vendors for technologies, but then we have to figure out what kind of regional PR we do about it um, or that we can team up as well as this tour of homes thing that um, you're thinking about. And is, so there's something there. And then there's work at the schools within, within the school stuff. Is there stuff that you want to do that you want to you need more people to do things i'm trying to um uh, i'm trying to think of for the sake of this committee time whether you want to at some point whether you want to say what you write up what you're doing at some point whether that's a good use of time to the extent that it gives slots for people to see if they want to help with something that, mm -hmm. that would be useful for you um, and, um, and I think Gino um, knows this already, the Sustainability Task Force um, has been started um, last, uh, the, two years ago, and, and Andy Keel has given his kind of like chairmanship to Don Fattori, who is the business manager of the DSHS, and Angela Lin, who is the student co-chair their first meeting will be um, next week uh, on September 22nd. And this will be a new composition of uh, students and teachers showing up. And they have identified a couple of um, projects and all can be found on the Sustainability Task Force website that's linked on the town, on the um, Sustainable Sherborne website. They will continue hopefully with these programs. And at the same time, I'm hoping to work with the, uh, down, uh, the, the uh, down to Earth Club for, for them to promote um, the actions that are on our website. So remember uh, that we had somebody to start our 
Instagram channel at the high school. And I will have to look for somebody who will continue doing that kind of like work. And I'm hoping to find, um, I do have some money in the bank, $500. And I was planning to start two scholarships at the school. And that was a suggestion from the last intern we had working on the Instagram channel. We will find one student who is going to run an Instagram channel and basically promote what's being done at the school. And then I'm hoping to find another student um, and post a scholarship to, to be a liaison for the ESC. And um, I heard Marianne Neutra saying it would be great if we had a student representative on the ESC. And I think that's a fantastic idea. And this way we can connect the school and the students to the work that's being done in, in this government body here. So those two scholarships, I think would be a great way to tie a student continuously for these two tasks. And um, Michael, you could help me defining those two scholarships if you do have time or somebody else, maybe Tom can help me to define these two kind of like scholarships, what they're about and what students need to do. And then we can launch them and I can send them up to high school and we can look at different candidates because I hope we will have more students apply for these scholarships because they were kind of like students want to get some money at the same time the recognition they can put on this, their um, college applications. And I think that's a good way to find people that are committed so I would need somebody to, to craft these documents with me and to find to, to define these roles. Marithia, I'd, I'd be happy to help you on that. Let's, let's uh, talk later. Um, thank you. Because these are the ones that I want to get going fairly quickly so that we find uh, you know, those two students that will help us with the ESC and also with the um, with the the what comes out of the school to create some videos some kind of like to get the students pulled into the sustainable Sherborne instagram channel to put on material like how people planned or what they're doing in the stf so ideally we find the students from the sustainable task force who is running our sustainable Sherborne instagram because that will then you know blend really well and, and basically, is, do you see the people at the, uh, whether it's the down to earth or the sustainability task force, mm -hmm. that there'll be people there, students there who would actively be promoting the sustainable Sherborne website and the use of, uh, of Mass Energize? That's right. exactly That's what I'm planning to do. I'm planning to have that particular student promote on the Instagram channel those actions that we that we had put together. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's um, obviously that would be great if we can get we can. I don't know how many people have actually signed up on the website, and the question is is how much um, activity we can get there. Um, then I guess we still have. So besides those, whether the issue of we do have this activity, I'm looking at the list here of, uh, of where is the, what do you ever report on the status of energy coaches? If everybody knows, I don't know how people realize that we people were trained to be energy coaches and to work with, with people to, uh, to think of a bigger plan for their house in terms of sort of a net zero by 2050 kind of plan. Um, whether, and it's an activity under the mass energized task, take actions. How many people, do you have any status of how many people have actually been doing it or whether we should be all trying to find people to get used to coaching um, if there are coaches available who aren't being used? Do you have a sense of that? I don't have a sense of that. Um, we, we had the coaches, 
basically after they were trained, uh, take on two things. Um, one person was working um, with Steve Constantine's house. And I think that moved forward. And Katie Hertz worked with another person um, and I'm blanking her name right now. I can look it up, but I don't know how far that has gotten. Um, I will have to connect with David if he is still on board doing this kind of work with us. Um, yes, he is. Yes, he is. But I don't know if he wanted to train a second cohort. Um, we <laughs> have at, at this at this point, he's not going to train a second cohort because the first cohort hasn't been fully employed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have slots. So there was a third we have yeah we have spots there was a third person who was working with someone but that person dropped uh, the, the client dropped out mm -hmm. um so there really are only two active coaches at the moment so we have two slots and i i know that david would love to have a bunch more and is more than willing to train another cohort but we need to get people so for all of us here yeah. we need to either uh use if people are not sure they can go read about it on the uh on the website or we could talk more now but either people here could could use it um and try it out for example it came up when i was talking with uh grizel about the fact that they're interested in doing some stuff in their house whether they should uh um whether you want to actually employ one of the energy coaches and and we should basically if if people here aren't going to use them we should go find somebody else that we know uh, and 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 get them to sign up for the energy coaching so that they could basically see how it works um, and and help them improve their skills as well, since this is the first round. So it's probably a little rougher at the beginning so that sometimes it's useful to have people who are quite into doing this um, to do it. So I don't know whether Grizel, you're interested in and uh, you can go. And I, you can go, I would say to you formally, go sign up on the sustainable Sherborne, go to the take action and take an action there where they say, uh, uh, do energy coaching. And I think, I think it gives you a phone number there or something. Um, and any of us, if, if we're not gonna do it, it looks like there'd be some more space that we should encourage people we know to, uh, to try it out um and and see whether it gets them going um so that's on the coaching side so we can all think about looking at that task and, and getting others to do it and then uh but in terms of other programs for town we do i guess we have to go figure out how we're doing this mass energize i mean the mass save program promotion i would assume mm -hmm. uh that dorothea we haven't really we just sign the MOU, I guess we got to figure out how to do whether one of the programs we want to do is make a big push to get people to do mass save audits through the all in energy MOU that uh, that hopefully will get better quality audits. Um, but I, at this point, I guess, does it make sense? I think it makes sense I'm putting it out on the table for you, Dorothy, and for everybody that whether if there's anything we're going to try to promote for now with the townwide effort is whether we want to make sure people do do the mass save audits, whether that's a particular priority, because that's sort of a first step in getting it and whether of all the things there, I mean, because that deals with the house mm -hmm. energy use. Um, well, Michael, I, would would that be part of a uh, energy coach uh, process? It could be part of it, or it doesn't have to be. It could. It's usually the first step to do working with a coach is that you have the audit done. But we could just push people. We could do a promotion of just getting people to do the mass save audits, so that people start at least doing the uh, what might be the low hanging fruit in their homes. Yep. I think that's. I think that's really important um, because. The mass safe promotion uh, should, it, it is required that if you're going to get an energy coach, you have to have a, a mass safe audit within two years. Um, but that's just for that program. I think we really need to promote mass save in general. Uh, what do you mean in general beyond the audit? 
Beyond the audit, yeah. I mean, I, uh, beyond the- Mass Save is the audit. audit. I don't think Mass Save amounts to more than yeah. the audit. No, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, instead of just I, instead of just thinking about it in terms of the coaching program, I think we really need to extend ourselves out with Mass Save in general, okay. not hooked directly to the program. Okay. And, and my, Michael, I mean, all our residents are getting the, you know, the flyers every month from Eversource and they're getting flyers from contractors, you know, in the mail. Uh, but, but you have this new avenue with this third party. Uh, and I forget the name of the company. Well, it's all in energy. Yeah. All in it. How, if, if I'm interested in doing a, a, another mass save right now, do I have to call in? All in energy, or if if I call the eight 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 mass save number, will they send me to all in energy? It's unclear who they'll send you to. What we're trying to do, and I guess uh, I haven't had time, or 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 I'm bringing it up now in a sense of that if, I, if somebody wants to help work on this all in energy route, where we would then have to just sort of publicize this particular way of getting the mass save audit rather than the generic mass save number, we would have this other phone number that um, would basically, they work, in a sense, they work, this all in energy works with ma for mass save. And it involved that we were trying to develop a specific script that when somebody from Sherborne calls up, we can get a better sense of what kind of, what they're interested in. And they might direct them to a better set of, of contractor that they use, um, who would then do the audit. Um, and that's because people have historically have had mixed experiences, what people say about getting a mass save audit. So it would be nice if somebody wants to work on that kind of effort of just sort of understanding what this MOU is, and then working out with them about making sure we like the script that they're gonna use with the Sherborne residents. Uh, which, for which there's a uh, some beginning draft material, and then the publicizing of Mass Save through this particular um, avenue of calling up the uh, All in Energy, um, which is on our website as well as, for example, even just putting it on the town website or putting it in in uh, Sherborne next door. The whole routine of what it would take to get it out, or even writing an article for the newspapers, which seem to be able to publish things. Um, if we write them. Um, so I think that that's, um, and I don't know whether to what extent where that fits in with how much you, Dorothy, you want to be part of that as well, I would think. Um, Michael, sorry, the, um, are you following the chat at, at all? I, think, um... I don't follow chat during meetings. Okay, good. Um, maybe well, I guess I should make that clear to people. Uh, it's hard enough following people that I'm not, I'm not a chat reader. <laughs> so um, the chat is open. I just opened the chat and it says, I think Brad um, just wrote, he can work with you on that if I interpret this correctly. Yes, I yeah, see I mean, that there were 24 chats. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, it seems like, I mean, it's clearly a residential initiative and um, you know, so I'm happy to follow your lead on it and you know contribute how you need me to contribute. I'm interested in it personally too, just because I agree that you know the uh, quality of the mass save assessments are very variable. Um, and so having this kind of additional QA step is, is intriguing and I think it's a good selling point. And um, yeah, I think when it's all you know you know ready to go, um to to launch if it already is um it needs to be communicated yeah then i'll talk to you about it because basically it seems to be ready to go and we and part of the issue is that we're work we're trying to find contractors who would do the work that we can actually directly deal with in terms of making sure they do a good job um so that we can have uh so that we can sort of close the loop both up front and after the fact that and they're supposed to actually survey Part of the oil and energy thing is that they'll survey people to see how it went um, and then also just work with contractors so that when they do the audits we know what they're thinking of and and to try to think of a bigger picture part of the problem is all and save well mass save is so limited to just the 
the audit and efficiency part and where, when do you, how do you then get people to transition to, okay, I've got my house cleaned up to what extent am I willing to look into improved uh, space conditioning stuff there. And that's a little bit of a carrot for some of these performance contractors that these are people who might be ones there, but that then begins to overlap with our vendor program. So there, there, there's a way to try to, we have to figure out how to knit all this stuff together so that we can sort of create a, a pathway for people that makes sense. But we could talk about that separately then. Um, then as it's 5.05 um, and I can see that we're running out of things that we're gonna have to continue this at our next meeting a little bit more. Uh, I would say that even though you have your hand up, Dorothea. Um, yep. the, I guess I want to figure out a, a next meeting time before people start fading away. Um, and whether we, can, whether we want to go back to our Tuesdays at 3.30 uh, or do the Fridays or whatever. And uh, um, it's been a while. We have enough. This topic that we want to talk through is still... We can continue it uh, if we want to go back to Tuesdays, which has worked for many of us, but there are new players here. And, and, and the new players seem to be, which is fantastic, a slightly younger generation that's still having jobs, unlike uh, some of us. Can, can uh, the three of you make 3.30 on a Tuesday? It's a little dicey for me now. I'm back in the office on Tuesdays yeah. and Thursdays. Um, I could probably yeah. swing it. I could. I mean, I work in academia, so we're, <laughs> we're a little easier going. Oh, there. of course, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're in some ivory tower somewhere, I guess, uh, fiddling. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, what about uh, Frank uh, Grizel? For, for 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 me, Tuesday. Um, every other week is not good. There's, there's always a, a meeting at my school. Friday works for me much much better. Uh, a Monday or a Friday is, is probably best. I mean, the Friday for now with the summer changing. I mean, it could work for me as well, or the or the Monday afternoons. I don't know. Uh, whether we have to have a, uh, except for Fred who can't raise his hand. Oh, I can raise his, he can raise his hand in a other way. Uh, yeah. How many people like a, if we're saying Tuesday is difficult for some folks, for how many people does a, uh, does Friday even work? I'm going to go through some other days. Yeah, um, most, most Fridays work for me. Yeah, and the same for me. Most oh, Fridays. I, I need to see people's hands in the, in the screen there. Okay. Oh, Gino doesn't look too good. Oh, uh, I'm I'm fine. Whatever. <laughs> okay, fine. He's all purpose. And is there also a Monday that people like or might prefer? Does Monday work for people? Um, or is that less attractive to? Uh, it folks? depends on the Monday. Um, I mean, we we can play it week to week. We don't have to keep a fixed routine on this thing here. The question is, is whether the whether we meet. I'd say in a practical thing of whether we meet uh, next Friday because we still have stuff to go on and people get integrating people's stuff or whether we do the 27th on a Monday. Um, uh, since I, I still want to go over a little, I'd like to think of, we still like to think of catching up on some of the projects we're doing and, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, sort of think about, and maybe we can get a little bit more Maybe the Monday, the 27th, we might know more about some other stuff. I don't know. I'm game to say whether we continue this on the 24th or the 27th, or we push it out even till October 1st. Michael, I'm not available on the 24th, but I am on the 27th. Okay. And there's still I'm, I'm, I'm not available on the 27th. No, oh, God, then, you guys, can you guys coordinate better? <laughs> uh, please talk to yourselves on your social hey, media. Exactly. Um, uh and then i'm just to, and then i'm gone for the next two weeks so i'm not back really until um the 8th of october after the 27th and you're not going to zoom in from whatever shangri-la you're off to um, exactly uh and uh the uh um and so what the 20 okay 
That's why I can't remember which is which. For other um, for others, the twenty fourth or the twenty seventh. What does that seem like for others? Does anybody have strong preferences between the two? Well, that's too early to meet versus okay. Um, the uh, and so we have to either give up uh, Tom or Andy for one of them, unless we just I'm trying to think of whether people have things in terms of getting people. Uh, I mean, it's only a matter of whether we even meet in two weeks. I mean, I'll be, I have enough to do because I, I haven't brought an update about the solar stuff. That I'm still trying to figure out the financing stuff that I've been talking to somebody, including today for financing options. Um, for me, it's just a Michael, more I, of- just to, just to throw in, I wouldn't be available on the 24th either because I'm running one of the EV vests that day. Okay, so that means the 27th wins. We're either doing it the 27th or the 1st of October. Um, Why don't you do it the 27th? I might be able to move my uh, okay. conflict. Fine, let's do the uh, 27th. Okay. 3.30. 30. Um, Gino's got his cue. Um, and, uh, and I'll try to see the agenda, which basically... That includes, we're gonna, it's basically a similar agenda to what they had today, um, but we'll stick in the environmental justice and we'll see if we can fit in a little of the, uh, and I guess it's talking about we could fit in the, uh, the heat pump thing for the hot water heaters as part of thinking about what we're doing for residential side uh, programs. Uh, okay, it's, it's well after time for everybody. Uh, um, Michael, one other, am I muted? Yeah, no, you're fine, what else? Okay. One other question, just from a note taker's perspective, did we ever review and approve meetings before I showed up? Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Anybody have any final questions or words before we all reconvene? And some people uh, feel more happy to reach out to Dorothea on some issues that you might've heard her talking about, mm -hmm. or Fred, or things you wanna do. Don't, don't let the meetings limit your involvement. Um, by all means, feel free to call uh, to talk to Dorothea because she's got lots of things going on. Um, <laughs> and I don't mind volunteering her for that. And I'll talk to you, Brad, uh, a little bit more. And I guess I'll bring you in, Dorothy. I'll update you on some meetings we had about the oil and energy stuff. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the three of us can have a little time at some point. On that point, I will uh, move to adjourn. One second. Of the we get to vote on. Did, did that you second to Tom? This is one of those really important reasons to be a member. You can vote on the journey. Uh, <laughs> that's about most of your voting. So that's why uh, that's it's not like I'm trying to sell a lot of seats here, but um, okay. Uh, no, any discussion? Okay, Michael, I, Tom. Hey. Andy. Hi. Fred. Hi. Well, we have hi. adjourned. Have a great everybody weekend. Everybody. Hopefully you're here. Have a great weekend, Thanks, everybody. And nice to meet Bye. you, the new folks. Right. Bye-bye.